One low, two low, let's the age of conversation. Hi, I'm Alessio Kikone, author and artist of the upcoming comic Blazer, and welcome to my channel. Now, I've done a few videos now. I've done a video on the history of werewolves, the history of zombies, and even more obscure creatures like Wendigos. I've done the history of them too. And I've stated in my last video that uh, I'd like to do something a little different. I got the idea for this video as a response video, so I'm going to structure it as such. So the video in question was a video done by Shadowverse City called What Medieval Weapons Would Dwarves Really Use? Fantasy Rearmed. And uh, let me preface this by saying that that was an excellent video. I'm uh, quite fond of uh, Shad's videos. I am subscribed to him. But ironically, I rarely agree with his conclusions. Not that they aren't well thought out and well well reasoned i just disagree uh, not completely obviously and i i feel that i can add something to this discussion on what would dwarves really use if they were real so this is going to be my response to him and while i was researching this the information for this video i i came at it from a different angle. See, this is where I differ from Shad. Shad came at it as, what if dwarves were fighting humans? Whereas I came at it by thinking, well, what would the dwarves most likely be fighting? And here, I have to say that I also, I'm going to be a little more narrowly focused than Shad. Shad made a more general fantasy question what would dwarves use in most fantasy situations i'm going to narrow it down more to like uh, the fantasies in D. &D. i'm going to use fantasy from D, D because i feel that a lot of modern fantasies take from D. &D. obviously D, D took from tolkien but now i feel like most most because RPGs, the video games as well as the role play, uh, the board games, they all derive in some way, shape, or form from D and D. As well, I'm going to put a, a bench line for the humans in this era, so we can kind of compare. Because why not? I would say the humans' technological level would be around 12th century, so 1100s, maybe turn of the century, so twelve, early 1200s as well, depending on where, of course. So when I first started uh, research for this video, I said, okay, first things first, what, what are dwarves? And actually, I have a definition here according to D&D. Here's their little flavor text. This is from the Monster Manual in 4th edition. Dwarves are creatures of the earth, as steadfast and hardy as stone. Industrious and inventive, dwarves live in the mountains of the world. They build remarkable fortresses and delve into the earth for riches and raw material. Dwarves acknowledge Morden as their creator, yada yada. That's not really relevant to this. Oh, they clash with goblins for territory and mining. That's a... Uh, that's uh, slightly more relevant. So, one of the main aspects of any dwarf um, backstory, um, I don't want to say legend, but that's not the word. Uh, essentially, their, their mythos, there we go, that's the word, mythos, is that they delve into the earth for riches. They're miners. They live underground. They live in the mountains. So I went and I found a book, of course I did, on medieval mining. And it was called De Re Metallica, written by... One second, I have his name here somewhere. Do, do, do. Georges Agricola. And 
And I believe he wrote the book in 1530. There's probably something I should have known offhand. Anyways, let's say 1530, about that time, because he was born in uh, 1494, March 4th, uh, 24th, sorry. Now, so I started reading this book. It was a great book. It talks about the minor. And the, the first part of the book, so it's actually a collection of 12 books to make essentially one big book of 500 pages. The first part talks about people's complaints towards mines. Nowadays, you know, we talk about deforestation. That seems to be a very old topic, even going as far back as the Middle Ages, even as far back as the Romans. But that's not really, that's outside of the scope of this video. I just thought that was interesting. And I started reading up on the miners and how they structure the mine. Obviously, there's the one at the top, the mining prefect. And then after he has something called the Berg, Bergmeister. This is the name they use in German, which is the second in command. And then both of them have a clerk and yada, yada, yada. And then after I found all the tools that they use, which I was fascinated, they had so, so many modern tools that we have and we think they're modern creations, they're not really modern creations. They were used in the past, but they were, they were stuck. They were attached to certain uh, geological areas. Like you couldn't use a water hammer. So a, essentially a hydraulic press or a hydraulic hammer if you weren't next to water. And I was going to read from this book, and then I, I realized that I don't really need to for the purposes of this this video. I found a, a very short, concise quote off of Reddit, and I think just reading from this is much better description of what a mine would look like. So if we're, since we're talking about mines and that dwarves live in mines, this would also be, one, how their, their lifestyle would be structured, and two... Um, the technologies that dwarves would have. And although this is interesting backstory, and I'll, I will read it just for, for I guess, um, creating a world in a, in a way, it's not really relevant to the response. So if you want to read Der Metallica, um, you can find it at Project Gutenberg, an amazing site. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll put a link to to where I found the book. It's a great read, but it's 500 pages. It was translated from Latin. And a fun fact, a lot of the words in the 1500s that they were using to describe mining were new, new words because they were new inventions. And Latin stopped evolving with the Romans. So he made, a, uh, Georgius Agricola, the writer, made up a bunch of... Uh, words for the for the text so let me read the little quote for the minds and then i'm going to get on to the more response oriented part of the video um as this one redditor puts it uh minds developed a lot during middle medieval times the induction of the suction pump and the human treadmill sometimes manned by a donkey horse or mule instead of a human allow miners to reopen old roman mines and dig much deeper in their own minds because they could dig deeper and use treadmills to lift ore and pump water away, medieval mines became more productive than they had been during the Dark Ages, which is reflected in the lower price of iron, which allowed more and more soldiers to carry more and more armor. How did a medieval mine look? Some were open pits, but most were mine shafts dug down and reinforced with wooden supports. The miners tried to follow the streaks of ore in the mountain, and the mines could meander quite a bit. The larger mines had not only pumps keeping water out, but also bellows to pump air down to the miners. To break the mountain, the miners would light fires down in the mining shafts to heat the mountain, and then rapidly cool it by throwing water on it. It cracked and was then much easier to pickaxe and shovel into small hand carts used to transport the ore to the shafts, where it was lifted by treadmill or water mills up to the surface, which it was crushed often by a water-powered giant hammer and wash to remove rock and earth to reduce the amount of slag produced when smelting iron in the surface uh, in a furnace sorry so yeah just to show you they have essentially primitive air pumps primitive 
water pumps, uh, primitive um, crane. There you go. Primitive cranes. Uh, primitive hydraulic uh, hammers. It's fascinating. We essentially all we did was iterate on this technology, which we obviously did a very good job of doing. Just look at our modern world. But, anyways, that's outside of the scope of this video. Let's get to some statistics. A uh, dwarf is, in according to D and D, fourth edition, dwarf is four foot three to four foot nine. So I would say probably four foot three for the women, four foot nine for the men. And they weigh about the same as a, a human. Now, when I was thinking of all the things that dwarf would have, I thought of what would they produce? And for food, especially. And so what could they grow? Well, not many things grow on the mountains. Olives do and grapes do. So they definitely have those two things. And there's not many animals you can farm on the mountains, but you can farm goats. So that means they would have goat meat. Uh, goat meat, goat milk, and cheese. But that also means they would have wool. So I think uh, a lot of depictions of dwarves that I've seen, usually they have like what looks like wool coats. And I think that's, that's accurate. But now to the response. So first and foremost, Shad, Shad first off, he starts saying uh, dwarves wouldn't be good in archery. And then he, he changed his opinion during the video. I'm going to agree with his first opinion in that dwarves wouldn't necessarily be bad at archery. But one, they would not be better than a human because archery is also related to... The, the power of a bow is related to draw length as well as the poundage of the bow. And uh, uh, Todd over at Todd Stuff explains it very well in his crossbow video, which I will also try to link to in in this video in the in the description below so i i don't believe like they'd be able to pull the same weight as an adult human male but they wouldn't be able to draw it as far back therefore they would probably be slightly weaker archers than humans but at the same time and this is really where i'm going to draw a lot of my conclusion from their main focus would be fighting in tunnels and in in D, &D at least their only other competitors would be kobolds who also live in caves in the mountains goblins as well ogres live in caves but they live more or less alone and they don't really live in the mountain but in natural formation so occasionally they might come across an ogre but that would be the biggest thing they come across and obviously other dwarves everything else if you notice is half their size so um shad says they'd have a reach disadvantage which is true if they're fighting humans but they would rarely come into conflict with humans it would be easier for most humans to just go and do business with the dwarves in the mountains because most humans don't do mining even even in historical context although a lot of mining was done most of the population did not go to mine they spent most of the time farming so although probably conflict would occur on occasion with dwarves they wouldn't necessarily be at war all the time kind of thing they would probably have a relatively amicable relationship and just like in modern military sense um, you always prepare for the war you are fighting for instance after world war ii everyone realized the distance we're shooting at is under 300 meters so we're going to make all our guns capable of shooting out to 300 meters, not so much further. Then we went to Afghanistan, and there's a lot of areas where you can actually shoot out to 1,000 meters. And a lot of troops were having trouble with that. For, and for instance, the SAS, I heard this from um, Larry Vickers. He, he, he was saying that in Afghanistan, a lot of the SAS guys that he met they used G3 rifles, which were using a full caliber cartridge, the 762 NATO, and they were actually able to still hit out to uh, to uh, 1,000 meters, whereas everyone else, they're using types of M16s, which is the 5.56. So they couldn't hit as far. So in the context of our dwarves, the dwarves would prepare to fight dwar other dwarves 
goblins and kobolds, and maybe on occasion ogres. But what you use to fight a giant's creature compared to a creature that's roughly your size, but like a dwarf is only a foot smaller than the average man. That's not a big difference. It is a difference, but not a huge difference. Um, it's different if it's a giant. Ogres are giant. So, just to say, they would prepare for their fights in caves. And in caves, caves, let's look at the cave fighting kind of like 18th century fighting on, actually, any century, but fighting in ships, especially in the in this time period. Missile weapons don't really work when you're fighting below deck. What we usually see, like, for instance, 18th century, what was the most common uh, weapon used in boarding actions? It was the cutlass. And although I'm sure projectiles were used, a big bow or even a small bow in a confined space, archers during the Agincourt campaign, a lot of them had swords on their hips. When the uh, advancing knights got to their lines, they dropped their bows and picked up swords, and ranged weapons are not very effective in in tunnels and in any dungeon. So if you're playing a Dungeon Dragons campaign, uh, maybe give disadvantage to ranged units when in a dungeon. Uh, that may or may not be fun, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> another question I asked myself, which is still related to ranged weapons. Again, I don't really see... Sure, they would have the technology to make crossbows, but again, why would they need crossbows? Probably they would have them, but they wouldn't be very common, if at all. I mean, for the occasional hunting outside, maybe. So maybe hunting crossbows. In general, though, hunting crossbows are not the same as military crossbows. They don't have the same requirements. So although they probably could be used in war, probably weren't. But regardless, I also wondered, would dwarves have gunpowder? Because they technically would have access to most of the materials. Then I asked myself, would they have access to sulfur? Well, then we have to ask, do they want to live in a volcano? I mean, humans live near volcanoes, but we don't live in the volcanoes. Dwarves would live in the mountain, therefore they would live in the volcano. They would be very close to the lava. Probably would get pretty hot in there, I would assume, and wouldn't be too pleasant. You're mining all of a sudden, oops, the ceiling collapsed and now I'm getting flooded with lava. Hmm. So I don't think dwarves would have gunpowder because they wouldn't have access to sulfur. This is my assumption. Um, then after we have to ask, do they have flamethrowers? Eh, maybe. That's a little more complicated a question. Let's, though, for the sake of this argument, let's say they don't. Because we can make an entire video on do dwarves have flamethrowers. So then let's get to the, uh, the, the, the sidearm and the pole weapon. Now, I agree completely with Shad on the sidearm. Falchions, perfect weapon for dwarves. I don't understand why dwarves are associated with axes to begin with. Let's think of it. Axes, one of their greatest advantages is that they're extremely cheap to produce. And there's, let, I'm talking about the, the single-handed axes here. Extremely easy to produce for people that don't have access to a lot of good quality steel. Dwarves are miners. All they have is good quality steel. So, give them a falchion. And what's similar to a falchion? slightly similar to a falchion, a cutlass. <clears throat> what have I been saying? The best weapon for uh, below deck fighting and mine fighting is a cutlass. So I say dwarves should have falchions. I completely agree. Now looking at the pole weapon, I, I don't think they necessarily need a big pole weapon. Again, they're fighting underground, but pikes were used, something called boarding pikes were used in naval combat, I'm not sure how large they were, but um, I still think a, a pole weapon of some kind, not necessarily a large one like a spear, but something like the length of a longsword. And 
they usually are given like Dane axes and stuff like that. Why? Axes are based off of t tools that are used for cutting down trees. But although, sure, they have access to wood, but they spend more time in a mine. They use pickaxes. Why not give them a weapon that is either a pickaxe or a hammer? So I was thinking a war pick or a war hammer or war hammer with a pick on the back end. That would be the perfect pole weapon for a dwarf. So falchions and pickaxes. Now, he also mentions shields next. And he says the big shield would be perfect for dwarves. And I agree, but... We have to ask ourselves, why would they use it? Remember, they have access to high quality steel. They could make very good armor. And I would say they would probably even have it at a, a level like the 14th century plate armor. So if we're thinking comparison, comparing with, uh, with humans, we said 12th century. And when it comes to plate armor, so, well, armor in general, dwarves would be almost 200 years ahead of the humans. That's how I think it would be. So sure, they could make big shields, obviously, and they would be very effective with big shields. But if they're covered head to toe in plate armor and they're in narrow corridors, they don't really need shields. Maybe a buckler for day-to-day -day life, the same reason why bucklers were popular amongst humans at that time. But the big shield, although it would be great for dwarves, I don't see them using it. And I think that's actually every every point he made. Uh, use of the bow, lack of reach, shields, and then falchion. Uh, yeah, I already mentioned the falchion. I completely agree with that. So yeah, this is probably the longest video I've made. I'm not sure I haven't checked the time yet. And so this has been my response video to, to Shad. Again, love his stuff. Link to his original video in the description. I'm probably going to make a series out of this, along with my other series, the uh, Of Their Nature series, where I talk about the history, the, the real history of the uh, creatures, in, uh, the fantasy creatures in modern folklore and fantasy. I'll definitely probably do a history video on dwarves as well but um for now i i, I kind of enjoyed this video um, i definitely want to do more like this and um i'm going to do some some history videos on uh quebec so there's an interesting battle i want to talk about and also another video i have planned is uh one on the devil brigade so i'm going to probably start another like military history won't go too in-depth in that because there are many other channels that probably do know more and do more in that topic than I do. But I I haven't seen much on these two topics, so I want to make those videos. So yeah, I hope you enjoy. Obviously, like, comment, and subscribe. I really like comments, so those are more preferred than the other two, but anything is, is fine. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed what you, you heard, and uh, yeah, have a nice day.